Hi everyone, I'm Marisol Nichols. Now you may know me as an actress from film and television. What you may not know is that I have been working in the anti-trafficking movement for over a decade. I've been honored to work alongside law enforcement as an undercover operative, both in the US and abroad, to help put bad guys in jail and help rescue some women and children. I created my foundation for a slavery-free world and this podcast to help prevent you or your loved ones from ever falling prey to these predators. Thank you, and welcome to the Marisol Nichols Podcast. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Marisol Nichols Podcast. I am so excited about our guests for this episode. So this is the Canadian Center for Child Protection, and they have been dedicated to protecting and fighting for children for over 30 years. Please welcome my amazing guest, the executive director, Leanna McDonald. Leanna, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here, Marisol. Thank you. I've um, Your work is incredible. Your organization has been working on reducing child sexual exploitation. You help with the location of missing children, as well as preventing child victimization. Um, Can you sort of educate my audience on how the Canadian Center for Child Protection started? Sure. It's really quite a tragic story that unfolded, and it was really many, many years ago, um, over 30 plus years. And uh, back then there was no technology, you know, at the time. And what happened is we had a a wonderful young girl, a 13-year-old girl named Candace Dirksen. And basically she was coming home from school phoned her mom and they, her best friend, in fact, was going to come over and hang out for the weekend. And Candace never made it home. And so what ended up happening, happening is obviously the police were called. There was an intensive a search to try and locate her. Nobody could find her. And it was roughly about six weeks after that her body was discovered mm-hmm. and she had been tied up um Ugh. and found murdered and so that uh just absolutely tragic and painful experience started the sort of kind of journey of our organization her parents the Dirksons, um didn't want another family to go through what they had mm-hmm. gone through and at the time you know it was police were um it was important that they were independent they were investigating and the family sort of felt that they needed to navigate their pain and, um, you know, sort of their efforts on their own. So we started originally as a missing children's organization dedicated to finding children and also educating kids on their own personal safety. It's always incredible the change that can happen from such a horrific tragedy. So thank you for putting that change in and giving parents who, you know, could possibly be going through the worst nightmare ever a place to call and a resource for help. So on behalf of every parent out there, thank you. For those of you that follow me on Instagram, I posted a video a little while back called the Unwanted Film Festival. And that was because the Canadian Center for Child Protection, or C3P, reached out to me. Um, For our listeners, and I'm going to repost that. I'll repost that on our podcast website and also on Slavery Free World's uh, social media channels. But for those of the us that are listening, instead of watching this, can you explain to our audience, Leanna, what the Unwanted Film Festival is? Okay, I'm happy to do so, but I'm just letting your viewers know this is a hard thing to hear yep. about. So, so basically, again, our organization through the tip line, our analysts work day in and day out. They get reports coming in against crimes against children. And sort of the most horrific ones that we see are those where a child's sexual abuse has been recorded and distributed on the internet. So you can imagine it's not just a, um, a, you know, a sexual crime that's been committed. It's an ongoing victimization where they fear, you know, for the sort of being recognized. They don't know who's seeing that abusive material. And so it's so damaging. So what we ended up doing a couple of years ago was sort of looking at this and saying, okay, We see all these children in these images. We don't know who they are. We need to find out more. We need to better understand what this victimization looks like. So essentially, we did a a kind of a global survey 
that started to ask really important questions. And the survey really, you know, disclosed many things that were really, really unsettling. And one of those things was that basically the, it, the fear of being recognized wasn't paranoia, that it had happened to countless survivors. They had people approach them, people try and find them online. So they were basically being stalked and harassed um, by people who wanted to further victimize them. Well, like this is just, it's, it's really impossible, you know, when you're a well person to wrap your head around what would, and you know, motivate a person to do it, but it happens. So essentially in the Unwanted um, Film Fest, we wanted to show the volume of child sexual abuse material, which we call CSAM, um, yep. and it's it's global distribution. And again, the fact that this is allowed, that we have not yet demanded that absolutely none of this should be on platforms around the world. So basically, <laughs> you can imagine these victims have been seen, but they've not been heard. And what we wanted to do was really to bring their voices and their stories into a very powerful installation that would really kind of underscore the insanity of this and the need for everybody, particularly governments, to take expeditious action. That's an absolutely, absolutely true. And for my listeners that may be um, haven't heard the episode, I had Layla McClevitt on, who's been taking on Pornhub and her organization. So for the listeners that didn't um, watch that episode or aren't familiar with this, what Leanna is referring to is literally child sexual abuse material, CSAM, that has been recorded and posted on sites like Pornhub for men to pay and download and share across any platform they want. And as I think that she mentioned this is this is a normal thing right now. This is going on as we speak everywhere and hence the name the Unwanted Film Festival. And so these survivors and the survey that um, C3P did really shows like it, it's sort of like these victims are being victimized all over again, all over again, all over again. Can you imagine being raped or molested and then having strangers watch that? and download it, and then sites like Pornhub making money off of that. So that is is what we're referring to here. And out of that, Liana, was born Project Arachnid. Mm -hmm. And I know that through Project Arachnid, you have assisted 12 million removal notices. Can you explain a little bit about Project Arachnid and what it does? Yeah, Project Arachnid yeah. was absolutely game changing. Basically, mm. what it did is it opened the curtain of, of the epidemic of CSAM on the internet. And so, you know, it's an important story. When we started this, again, here we were looking at, you know, better understanding the experiences of these survivors. And then we had learned from the survey, get my CSAM down, the ongoing harm that exists for survivors when their material is allowed to stay up. I do want to note, too, that one of the other really damaging and harmful things is it normalizes for right. others the sexualization of children. So it isn't just about the victim and the images. It's also about the societal uh, impacts uh, of this that we really have to sit up and understand. So essentially, we decided we took one of our victims and we said, let's try and get her material down. We developed in-house a technology platform called Project Arachnid. And basically what it does is it identifies known CSAM on platforms, automates sort of notices for removal. And we are right now at a point where Arachnid is issuing roughly 20,000 notices a day. So wow. you can imagine the scale. And this is only where Project Arachnid crawls. So essentially, this has been game changing. The other thing that why it's so important is not only about removal, but it also is sort of um, a level of accountability. Ar Arachnid tells us who's, what services are being used. 
Are they complying with removal? Who are the bad actors? And we're able to harness that information and share it uh, with governments around the world to say, look, now is the time to take action. We can tell you exactly what is going on. And it's time now that we stop letting companies blow smoke and tell us about all the things they are doing when we have the evidence through Arachnid that it's not good enough, not nearly good enough. A hundred percent. So, so just to sort of spell it out slowly for the audience that may not be so familiar, again, CSAM stands for Child Sexual Abuse Material. And your program, Leanna, has, Arachnid is like a spider, right? Yes. So it's sort of like um, a spider that goes along all over the internet and finds images of children being mm -hmm. sexually abused. Mm -hmm. And then with those images, you're mm -hmm. notifying 20,000 notices a day, did you say? Correct. Correct. So, so this is that's this... the volume that we're looking at here. Well, it's, it's even, it's, it's even worse than that. So this is just where we're going. This is just one organization doing this. So this is like, again, this is something that we cannot, uh, really, um, underscore more that, that what this tells us is that we have had a historic failure as a society, as a world of addressing this problem. So it really is, a, you know, a really important wake up call also about, you know, sometimes in history, you have to look back at the wrongs and you have to take responsibility for yeah. what wasn't done. And so this is one of the things that we are really at a point where we are mobilizing people from around the world to say enough is enough. There is absolutely no justification at all why known child sexual abuse material should be re-uploaded or uploaded on the public internet. Now, the mm -hmm. other thing with Pro Project Arachnid is it has the technology tool to allow companies to use that to stop and prevent the upload of known CSAM on their platforms. And so, you know, it really begs the question, if it's technically possible, why isn't it being done? That was literally my next question. Who's using this? So we do have, I think, about 45 companies right now that are oh. actively using the API, uh, the platform to be able to use that to, to prevent the, the proactive, it's proactive detection. Now, mm -hmm. the big companies, so what, the, big, the big actors, you know, like we would hear about, they're in fact not. And what the position is, is that we have our own technology tool to be able to stop it. So the thing is, is, is where I think we struggle. We are all for any company using whatever technology similar to Project Arachnid to do this, because at the end of the day, that's all we want. We want all hands on deck. We want it to, to happen. But the problem is, is like we're seeing the volumes of reports on CSAM are through the roof. So right. clearly something is not working. And so right. the, the issue is, is we need to have broader accountability and transparency so that we can actually measure the, you know, effectiveness and who's doing what and who is not. And then we know we have some companies, big companies that are doing really pretty much nothing. So mm -hmm. I think, I think the problem is, is the way that the, the construction of the internet didn't allow, it gave the keys to industry. It basically right. let them do everything tied to moderation. They get it to, got, you know, we're in a position to decide what was going to be um, seen on their site. So user generated sites, right? Their terms right. of service is what they basically said. We, you know, have our terms of service. We can do this and we can do that. Well, in fact, we, you know, the problem is, is there's no oversight. There is right. no transparency. So let's talk about moderation. Tell us how you decide if a teenage girl at the age of, is 14, right, when she could look like, you know, like this is the challenge. What we know is we're missing a whole a swath of victims because nobody can tell. And anybody who's a girl particularly, you know, looking back in junior high or high school, like the variance in, in, in development. And you had really young kids 
who were uh, pretty sexually mature. So, I mean, the whole, the whole thing is just backwards. And so, um, the other big problem we see is we're talking, when I'm talking about, you know, egregious CSAM, I'm talking kids who are under the age of like eight, under the right. age of 10. And there's absolutely no question about what is or is not. And we're still having serious amounts of that material. We have victims that were victimized over 15 to 20 years ago. And mm -hmm. I can still locate their videos that are available on the internet. And how do we in our right minds allow for that to happen? That's the question. You brought up a wonderful point, which is look, with the birth of the internet, it gave us access to so much information that in the past, obviously, we would never have. And there's some wonderful things that went along with the Internet. I can talk to somebody in India. I can I can see something in another far, far, far away country that I would never have seen, um, which has been wonderful. But at the same time, this sort of technology was unleashed on society. And as you mentioned, there's no oversight. So a child that was raped... 10 years ago or today, those images and videos are living on and on and on and on. There was a bill that you passed or introduced, not Bill 35, because I want to get into yeah. Bill 35, but another one that you introduced to um, the Canadian government that sort of speaks to this issue. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I'm not sure which one you mean, because we are moving a number of things forward. And Canada's online safety bill, it has not been tabled yet. That is what okay. we're waiting for. So it might okay. be, you know, more kind of prudent to kind of talk a little bit about that. So what, yes. what where we're going right now is countries. I just want to put this out because what you unpacked, even in what you just described, is a global problem. So yes. it doesn't, what we need is some, some harmonization with governments around the world. So we really have, we're so far behind, generally speaking, you know, governments, it's hard to move forward with legislation. And so what's essentially happened is, you know, in our efforts to sort of um, kind of unpack this, time has gone by. And so mm -hmm. it's caused a lot of, of damage. And so now we've got the government of Canada that is moving forward with legislation is going to be tabled soon. We've got the UK government which has its online safety bill. And we have Australia. We've got a couple the countries are now sitting up and getting it. We do mm -hmm. have, and again, what I need to really underscore, what we're talking about here is not anti-internet right. at all. It isn't. It's about the fact that we allow children and adults to um, intersect in unsafe, unsupervised ways. We've allowed mm -hmm. children not to have any rights. So when we get to the question of CSAM, what is a child to do? How do they exercise any sort of right? And as we right. know, you know, Section 230, you know, provided that sort of immunity in the efforts to make sure that Internet flourished. And what it's done is it's kind of giving companies some protections on, you know, the you, user. Sorry, what is Section 230 just for audience? Because they're not going to know. Yeah, so it's 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 from the it's a, it's a part of U.S. law. I think it's the Communications Decency Act, basically. Exactly. It's, okay, yep. and so yep. essentially, um, but what it did is uh, it it allowed at the time to give companies sort of immunity when they yep. were dealing with user generated content. So in terms of civil remedies and actions, it really restricted that. So I'm certainly not an expert on how this is all playing out in the courts in the U.S. But what I can tell you is that 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 provision has been what's caused all of the problems tied to, you know, making holding companies to mm -hmm. account in, in a different way. And so while yes. we're waiting for governments to move forward with regulation, we still have that barrier in our way in terms of finding other types of remedies so survivors can, you know, take some action. Quickly, sort of for the layman in my in the audience. Back in the late 90s, there was a law passed called the Communications Decency Act. And what it was, was it was an attempt to sort of somehow protect companies that, that were on the Internet. So like a Google or a Facebook or something like that. And so when she mentions user generated, she means like, let's say Facebook, right, where a user who's using it posts something online it was protecting Facebook from, let's say, a lawsuit 
from whatever the person put online. So in, in theory, it makes sense, right? So if someone, you know, some user posts, you know, I don't know, I'm gonna, I got sick from jelly beans, da 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 da, da then no one's gonna sue Facebook for saying jelly beans are bad. It sort of protected that company. The loophole here is that when you have user generated content like CSAM, right? Child sexual abuse material, it's allowing it's allowing literally you're giving rapists the right to upload the raping of kids to a platform such as Pornhub or something such as that. And then Pornhub and these companies are going, well, see, you know, we're not responsible because, you know, the rapist was using us and we're just the ones, you know, hosting it. Mm -hmm. And so it's really presented a major problem in this industry. And so this is what um, Liana is talking about. And governments have been fairly slow, especially the U.S., in, in changing that and making companies responsible for child sexual abuse material. I mean, you'd think it'd be a no-brainer. And Marisol, can I just add? Can I just add to that? Because yeah, it's really a, it's please. an important point you're making. I think that your your um, listeners and viewers they need to also understand something. Think of all the protections we provide to children in the offline world, and right. and everybody's accountable for that. Whether it's a playground and what are some of the standards that we expect on that? You know, uh, cars, safety. Um, yep. When we look at all of that. And yet we have absolutely, you know, zero, zero regulations or accountability on the right. online spaces. And we just kind of recently launched um, a kind of a campaign about that. Like it's insane. Mm -hmm. And I think any average person who is already witnessing or they know somebody who's in some way, you know, been victimized because of all of this. And and the last thing on your point I want to make, which is really important going back to Arachnid and what we know, what we're mm -hmm. talking about here is facts. We, a number of years ago, ended up um, issuing sort of a number of notices to a really kind of known sort of company in Europe. They had millions of what we knew through Project Arachnid uh, of images and videos. Um, millions, I just want to highlight that. Mm -hmm. Millions of mm -hmm. images and videos of child sexual abuse material. Mm -hmm. Right. And, okay, so, and so again, the, the challenge is, too, is how, you know, when people encrypt things and they put it in services, the provider doesn't always know what's there because of that. What ended Fair. up happening is we provided, we went in and we decrypted, we found, we concluded, we issued notices after notices after notices. And in fact, nothing happened. And mm -hmm. we, it was only until the media where we kind of went out and said, look, this is just not okay. And, and I'm talking about some of the victims that are over 15 years. And mm -hmm. here we are. So what it does, and, and it ended up, the article came out, media exposed, and it all came down. It all came down. But this company was knowing. They were knowing because oh, yeah. we were issuing them notices. Mm -hmm. So, they, so you know, I think why I'm telling the story is it's a good example of how there isn't any kind of reason why people, these companies have to do anything because there's no right. consequence. If there's no consequence, they don't have to invest you know, right. the same types of resources into these things because it's, it costs them money and right. it doesn't, it, there's no, you know, the rate of return isn't there. So this is why when we look at the point you're making about these various things that have for years protected and the need for regulatory frameworks, this is exactly why, you know, we've had 15, 20 years for companies to figure it out and they have not. So it's time to take the keys back and it's time to start making sure that citizens are safe on these platforms. Thank you for your persistence on behalf of survivors everywhere. And you work with an organization or created the organization of Chicago 11. Yeah. And I'm from Chicago. So I, I was very interested in this anyway. Uh, can you tell us about the Chicago 11? Yes, they're actually, we call them the, there's less than, there's the Phoenix 11, they're the kind of Chicago males. Sorry. That's okay, <laughs> okay. that's okay. Chicago but, males, okay. But anyway, we, they, we did the same thing. Like, we, here we were with these attorneys, we had a whole male population that were little yeah. boys, 
you know, um, or, yeah. or, you know, young, young kids, and they were victimized, recorded, and again, same sort of situation. So we brought them together again, uh, in, in Chicago, and we kind of bonded that, you know, together, to, and they were able, this was what was really, really important. Yeah. It's so hard for victims of child sexual abuse to talk about it. Sure. rightly so and you know you can see too with men particularly being able to open up about that um is so incredibly difficult the mm -hmm. value in bringing a safe group together to be able to you know share as they were comfortable and to sort of anchor each other in you're right. not alone you know we're together and we're going to be okay and so it was just, you know, we've been we've been doing work with them differently. The challenge with that situation, a little bit COVID hit. And so we were right mm -hmm. at the beginning where everything, you know, kind of got kind of stuck. So we de definitely work uh, with with them on, again, statements that we want, recordings, interviews with media. And again, they all have to be protected. And I do want to yeah. say, which is really important, can you can imagine we have some of our survivors that we work with that today they are still talked about they are people are trying to identify where they might be living and so <sighs> when we talk about their personal safety imagine right. their, their personal safety is at risk we have survivors who have had to change their whole identity because they can't imagine losing your identity you can no longer be marisol Right. And, and, you know, the consequences of that, because you cannot risk um, being injured or identified. So, right. you know, the Internet has got a very, as we know, a very dark side. And the anonymity, anonymity that it has provided mm -hmm. has allowed those very evil people to try and do very awful things to others. And yeah. so this is a, a different layer of injury. This is a different layer mm -hmm. of harm. And so again, we need to take seriously that action is needed. That's beautiful, Anna, and, and couldn't be more true. Um, we've talked a lot about that. And each organization that I've had on here has sort of different approaches on how to help children before the fact, mm -hmm. right? And I know you have a wealth of um, education resources and prevention resources. Can you talk a little bit about that, sort of the preventative side of this issue? Sure. Now, it, it's yeah. really important to thank you for talking about that. You know, prevention mm -hmm. is absolutely key. It's key. And we all know that. But I do separate two things. It's important that we don't, prevention is something that also people can kind of default to. Oh, let's get in front of the problem, right? Let's, right. let's do this. And I'm going to talk about why that is important and I'm going to get there. But we sure. can't forget that, okay, that's true. But it doesn't mean we now don't deal with the historic mess that we have with CSAM everywhere. 100%. So, so what we're very cognizant of is that shift. So when, when people say, oh, well, you know, and you might even have some listeners, well, we should prevent it. Well, if it was that simple, we would be <laughs> preventing, we wouldn't have any of this to begin with. And what we know right. is that, you know, sexual, child sexual abuse happens in secrecy. And mm -hmm. one of the things we learned from our survey is you, we cannot rely on children to disclose. And, no. you know, we of course want that to happen, but we're putting, it's just too much of a burden in so many instances of why kids don't tell. And right. so, what we need to do is there's so many different things. So we look at it on a couple of fronts. We look at it in terms of how we develop capacity through education. So that is in schools. We have curriculum that goes right across the country that talks about personal safety for children. We start talking, but we have to, we look at it from an age appropriate model also. So we are right. doing developmentally appropriate things and also new skills that kids need to learn as they're getting older and having more exposure to others. They're having more personal freedom. So we have sort of a whole entire sort of education program. Now, your readers, listeners, for any age group whatsoever, 
any issue that you're dealing with, any concern related to your child, of a child you know, go and get it. We have activities for kids to do. And it's been shocking how many people have come into us where a grandmother would be saying, I was doing, you know, your, the, your safety book, your safety rocks book. And, you know, my little granddaughter told me something and I would never have known it. So it's really done in yeah. a way that's safe. You need not to terrorize. So we have a number of that. Now, yes. the other part I want to talk about going back to sort of some of the harder problems is it's really about also ad adults paying attention to other adults behavior mm -hmm. right so you so, thank so, you yes yeah so what we did is we developed a program a whole program called commit to kids that looks at child serving or organizations and creating sort of whole policies and whole a program to start identifying weird or concerning boundary breaking behavior before something happens and so we really have an responsibilities we have to have those adults who are paying attention to yep. again odd behavior because we know that in many instances kids don't stand a chance if we have a very motivated person who's going to be doing something so mm -hmm. this is where we have to d take a deep dive there isn't any sort of 30 minute crash course in staying right. safe this is because we're dealing with very very um you know, deceitful and, and complicated behavior. So we can have, you know, many, many of those with the problematic sexual interest in children, you know, they, they are very charismatic. They might yeah. really, that's why, you know, the, oh my gosh, he was the greatest guy. Everybody, yep. you know, like he was so helpful. There's no way, there's no way. <laughs> and so, yep. you know, we know that this is exactly the narrative. And so, I think that that is a lot of what we do. We have training videos on our site. Any organization that serves children can come in and get free access to all of that. But it's really about mobilizing people to really identify when something is not okay and cutting that off at a time or making that, putting that person no, on notice that you're yeah. noticing or I'm not comfortable. So no, there's a it's, lot it's there. It's huge. That's so important. I think that's senior, you know, because we talk about educating kids and uh, like you said, age appropriate education. And how do you educate kids so that you don't overwhelm them or yeah. even put it in their minds? It's it's sort of a, a tough, very touchy, delicate situation. But senior to that is educating adults. Uh, to, in, to, in an article in today's Globe and Mail, or one of our um, leading national papers, you know, we, we had two of the families we deal with who lost their children, they died by suicide. And mm, right. uh, part of it, the, being able to access, you know, in, information about, you know, suicide, commit suicide, um, sex extortion rings. We now have situations where children are being um, sort of force fed algorithms that mm -hmm. are harmful and damaging. And we have no guardrails, no right. guardrails around that. So when you ask the question like, okay, what needs to be done? Well, that's, we need to unpack all of the yeah. ways in which children are vulnerable tied to technology and how offenders around the world are misusing that to their mm -hmm. advantage. And you know, one of the moms that it's just so heartbreaking. If you can imagine her boy, great kids, it's little sisters. They were supposed to go over to grandma's. Within three hours, he was sextorted by an organized crime outlet out of Nigeria, and he took his own life. Oh. And he felt hopeless. And, you know, right. it's just, it's been, you know, just a, you know, a year. And how does a parent understand that? How do they reconcile that? How do they how do they get up and move on? And you know, we think sit back and go like, no, that is just one example. We could give you yeah. countless examples. And so I think when we kind of look at what what would I like to for ever all of your viewers lis listeners to get out of this, we need to like arm up. We need to get ourselves mobilized. Yeah. We need to start demanding that we get this fixed. And it doesn't mean that we're the ones who have to say how it gets done. That's the job of, of those who run the platforms. They, If they're going to create a platform, they need to know that it's safe for kids. We need mm -hmm. legislators to start moving forward and forcing accountability to wrap around that safety by design platform. And then finally, 
We have to sh shift the paradigm. We have to put child safety and the protection of children first. Mm -hmm. We do it in all other ways. Offline children are right. inherently given protections right. that, that are, are supplied to them. And somehow we've just let them kind of be on their own, tied to technology. <laughs> and finally, I want to say, and we've put the blame on parents. And right. this is the problem. There is, we've learned this, we've lived this for, I've been doing this now for 25 years. Mm. There is no way for parents in all capacity to keep up with the risks right. to their kids. Because it's not what you do at home necessarily on devices. It's not only, you know, the education that you get. They might have siblings. They might go to a friend's house or they might be at right. school. We can tell you countless ways in which kids are vulnerable. And so we're not saying we're going to eliminate all things. And I'm not saying that all kids are going to be injured. But what we're saying right. is we need to do better. We have far too many examples of the ways that we have failed children and we have failed childhood. And so I think that this is an important sort of opportunity. We're at a time in history I really do feel. It'll sound like I don't, but I am cautiously optimistic that we are now moving the needle. We are waking up. And I feel that we will have a time of reckoning when we will look back and say, well, you know, what took us so long? I 100% I agree. I think it's come to such a fever point. There's been so much damage. There's been countless, 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 countless crimes and horrifying things committed that it's the boiling point has been hit. And I really do share that hope that things are coming out of this and that this is the time now where we are like enough. Yes. It is time to protect children. And you bring up such a valid point that offline we have so many protections. Make sure your child wears a seatbelt in the back seat. Make sure that that thing is strapped in correctly. Make sure this, cha da 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 but online it's a free for all. Just think about this. You even think of offline where if your kids are going to an adult, they can't get into an adult's site. You know, they are, you know, magazines are hidden behind things, windows are blocked, and yet they can go online directly and type in something simply and get the most graphic material with no guardrails, no age verification, nothing. nothing. And we are learning more and more about the damages that are being done. <laughs> and again, this is really where we look at it through the lens of how is this good or bad for children? And right. not that audit, that review, that anything has, is absolutely non-existent. Right. No, and you actually mentioned something that I thought was very interesting, and I agree with you. It's almost like the algorithm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like you said, is sort of force-feeding yes. some of this material to children. Mm -hmm. Can you can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, more? and you know, there's the case of, of Molly Russells out of the UK, young girl who, who died. Um, and she was being um, fed the most horrific algorithms, the, the pro-anorexic, the whole thing. Her father, I just would encourage if you kind of, he is a huge advocate and maybe one time we, you could get him on your show, sure. Marisol. He, he sums it up. When they went in and they did a, an inquest and they looked at what this little girl was getting force fed, it was beyond so basically if you know they're the curating automatically forced delivering um more and more harmful um material and they they, they could not believe what, what that little platform? girl was getting fed hmm? what was the platform i think there were various i think it was, instagram was one for sure there were a few of them and I think i think at the time meta testified in the, in the inquiry so that was we're, all we're part actually of that. yeah we're actually having Meta on, um, I believe, for the next podcast. But it is something that I've noticed. Like my daughter on TikTok. TikTok was, too. TikTok too. Yeah, oh, yeah. She'll, she was like, Mama, how do I stop this? Yeah. I clicked on one thing and I didn't even mean to. And then she was bombarded yes. with material. Yeah. Bombarded. I mean, she's like, there's no way. She finally came to me because she's fairly educated. I'm a mom. And she's like, okay, I figured out how to beat it. 
is that I just scroll through. I don't even stop on it. And I have to do that like 30 times before the algorithm or change. And I have to click on cat videos and watch the cat videos for more than 30 seconds Please. to beat the algorithm, mama, so that I'll get more of those. And is that she had to and, work at it? No, but isn't that insane? And if you again going back to the comparison yeah. offline, you look at TV cable, like old school, like where, like you know, we would have they had ad standards, right? You couldn't, you would right. have advertising standards even for children in all right. other spaces, but not online. <laughs> and so right. this is this is just again, um, it's just the perfect storm of harm. And so I think what we need to do is really, we're starting to get mobilized. We're starting to work with other, there's some wonderful groups, you know, like Fair yeah. Play also in the US, they're doing mm. some groundbreaking work. We need the people who are going to be the truth tellers and the ones that are actually going to be calling out to account because there's a lot of work to be done and it's going to really require sort of a very organized way of going about it. And I do mm -hmm. believe we are starting to make some progress on some of the age verification, mm -hmm. which is huge for us. Huge, we're, seeing, yeah. we're seeing the damage. We have um, children advisory groups. We're hearing little 10 year olds tell us about how damaged they are from what they've seen on the internet. and. Yeah. You know, it's creating just so, such, such, you know, injury. So I think what we really need to do is start looking at ways that we can collectively learn from other jurisdictions. What is working? Mm -hmm. What needs to be done? And start catching up because we are really, really behind. And so that's what needs to happen. Thank you. And I always sort of try to end a podcast, you know, end an episode on two things. One, um, lighter note, mm. a win, yeah, a success story. And if, if you have some of those, I would love for you to share them. And in addition, you know, you mentioned wins and progress. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about perhaps some of the wins and some of the progress that we are making? Oh, so that we, you know, yeah. it's a it's important. And thank you to everyone for listening to this. It's all really dark and yeah. hard subject, but we are making, if, if, I mean, you know, it'd be remarkable if you were in one day in this building and you can hear analysts on the phone with, you know, kids around the country or around the world who are desperate for help. And then we put that life jacket on them and we get them to the other side. And then we get these, you know, notes. Thank you so much. Parents coming in saying, you saved my yeah. child's life. You know, she came to me. She, you know, we're, we transition kids to talk to a safe adult. So we've got all kinds of like day in, day out, you know, sort of moments where we look at each other and we said, you know what, we just saved someone there today. Um, kids who are being extorted. We have other uh, bigger things, you know, uh, a couple of times now we've knocked off the internet massive sites hosting millions of CSAM. Um, when that happens, we just had another one with a different um, actor uh, yesterday. And so when we are able to do that, um, it makes a world of difference. We've had situations where we have had one victim, she had 10, we issued tens of thousands of thousands of notices and got basically most of her material almost gone from the public visibility. And she wrote us this note and said, I can finally live. I don't have to run home yeah. from school every day. And I hide, I've hid from the world for 10 years and now I can get up and feel like I'm going to make it. So, you know, it's, it's sort of, it is the type of work that is very, very draining, but you know, what we have in us as humans is, you know, fundamentally, you know, people are good. There are yes. a lot of wonderful things in people. And I think we're at a time where we need to kind of ask ourselves how, you know, how are we contributing? You know, it, it doesn't need to be a giant thing, but it can be a small thing in the life of a child. And, mm -hmm. you know, from checking in, you know, to noticing something positive, to sharing a story about how tough times and things can be, especially in today's world, but we get through it. And, you know, those, it's sort of, you know, some of those, uh, you know, inspirational and caretaking and yeah. empathetic moves that actually every day make a difference. It's the small things that each of us need to do. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And for our listeners, we're going to put our website on here. But um, if you are just listening, it's protectchildren.ca. 
and you can go there for a wealth of resources, both if you're an adult, children, tell a friend. It's an incredibly informative website, and there's also links to other resources there as well. Leanna, is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to add or share? Oh, you know, I think we've covered a lot today, but again, just, <laughs> yeah. but, but closing on with your listeners, there is, again, there is hope. And I want to yeah. make sure that we convey that, yes, there are dark moments and we do, we're living in a time of difficulty. Um, there's, there's things that can be done. And just to remember that, that that's really, really important. And as you said, Marisol, and I just want to thank you again for giving, you know, my agency this opportunity to share these important, you know, stories and information. Thank you very much and our resources are there we are here for you and whatever we can do to help we're here thank you for listening to the marisol nichols podcast and please do not forget to click like and subscribe and a big shout out to wd han for our theme song something's gotta change see you next time